Thank you for checking out this No Spoilers movie review. This is for the 1973 film Ganja and Hess, which, when I'm recording this, is currently streaming on the Shudder Horror streaming service. Um, off the bat, I do need to say something about this video. I apologize if the camera starts moving or anything. My cat is on the prowl, <laughs> and she is on the table, which is a folding table that this is on, so it might move if she starts moving around, or she might get in the shot because she seems to really want some attention, which means she wants something. Food. Uh, okay, so let's talk about Ganja and Hess, like I said, from 1973. So the writer and director, his name was Bill Gunn. Initially, he was um, he was approached to do this film, and they had said, this is kind of a little spoilery, but you would read it in the synopsis of, you know, like the little teaser uh, logline. Um, it's uh, just to make a black vampire film. Now, he was approached to do this, and he was just like, I don't want to make a black vampire film. But then he thought about it, and since he was able to write it and direct it, he had the ability to shape what it was going to be. So he was like, I'm going to make it something more, make it something metaphorical, and he did. So a lot of it is metaphor, according to him, of addiction and dealing with addiction. And you really see it throughout the film, with uh, especially with the fact that they break it up into three sections. Um I believe it's three sections, unless I missed the fourth one. I start honestly started to lose some attention toward the end because it's like a two-hour film, basically, which has no business being a two-hour film, to be honest. But anyway, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, yeah, so they break it up into three portions, and it it has like title screens for it, and it works on the level of vampirism, but it also works on the level of addiction. So I think the writing is really good for this film. Uh, the metaphor works really well. I think there's a lot of cool things that are said in the film. And just like through metaphor, but also like through actual dialogue, there's some cool things. Oh, there goes the cat. And she's leaving, so that's all good. So, um, yeah, so I thought Bill Gunn did um, quite a good job, especially for the fact that it was like a budget of like $350,000, which in 1973 you know, that was worth a lot more because if you do it with inflation, it's going to be a lot more nowadays, but it's still not a ton for a film. And the film looks like it's lower budget. The actual visual um, preservation of the film doesn't look super great. It looks kind of uh, very cheap, almost like home video-esque, but it's still a good film and it's still worth watching in my opinion. So th this film was actually remade in 2014 as Duh, Duh, Sweet Blood of Jesus by Spike Lee. Now that's a film that I've actually had on my list to watch, so I'm very, very glad that I ended up watching Ganja and Hess first, knowing now that that's the source material, that's the original script for The Sweet Blood of Jesus, which I will now go watch, well, not right now go watch, but at some point in the near future go watch and have in my mind Ganja and Hess. So I really like that. Uh, this stars Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Jones, which people will know him from the original Night of the Living Dead. This is the only other starring role that he ever had. Uh, so Ganjin Hess and the Night of the Living Dead, that was it. Uh, which is really interesting because um, he's a, he does a good job. Like, I don't understand. I, I assume, I was reading up on his life and I was assu I'm assuming that it was his choice. He went on to do some teaching and acting. Um, so, yeah, and he only lived until, like, 1988, which is pretty sad, because maybe he would have gotten back into doing way more acting. He did some directing, too, though, that's important to note, but, um, I think it's cool that if you like, uh, Night of the Living Dead and you liked Dwayne Jones' performance, it's good to see him in, um, Ganja and Hess, especially because I think his performance is even better in Ganja and Hess, to a degree. He was very good actor for that time you have to keep in mind for that time because you can't compare like 60s and 70s acting to like 2019 it just doesn't compute because it's come a long way so you know what is my cat oh, cat's being crazy sorry um the film is discussed in the documentary horror noir which is on shutter currently so horror noir is a documentary about um black horror uh, and it's it's kind of like the history of black horror and the significance of black horror, and I will say that you should definitely watch it. I watched that maybe about a year ago or so now. It's a really good documentary. It's extremely well done, and for me, I like watching documentaries to learn new things. Now, I had known about a bunch of black horror films and seen a bunch of black horror films, but seeing it in the context of people who 
it, it's meant for people who it means a lot more to is really cool to kind of see a perspective. One of the main things that kind of came up was for the longest time, people, people who, um, black people hadn't seen themselves on the screen. And so horror was kind of one of the, the major areas that a lot of progression was made towards seeing more black actors on screen and black directors and black screenwriters. Um, so horror was kind of at the forefront and it's just a really cool documentary to kind of see everyone's perspective on it because, you know, me just being a white male, I have my white male perspective mainly. So to hear other perspectives is very eye opening, to be honest. And it's just, it's very, very interesting. So I would definitely recommend horror noir, especially if you're a fan of Ganja and Hess, because they have a significant, well, not significant. They have a, a chunk of time that they talk about Ganja and Hess and the significance of that film and they also talk about Dwayne Jones and his impact on everything. So it's cool. Um, but I highly recommend that documentary. It's very, very nice. Um, uh, this has more of a real life look to it because of its lower budget. It, Like I was saying, it looks a little bit home video-esque. When it looks the most home video-like is when they're in a church. They have an extended portion towards the end that's in a church. And that actually is way too long. They should have cut that down and it makes it seem even more like this is someone's home video and they just didn't cut anything out. They just filmed everything. But that type of stuff makes it seem more real, which actually works for the overall tone of the film, in my opinion. Um, and also the dialogue kind of does that too. The dialogue wraps into like how it's written. It seems more real life. It's a little bit Mumblecore-esque. I know Mumblecore is not really something that people have talked about until recent years with, um, well, recent-ish years with, like, Ty West and his whole crew doing the Mumblecore films. But watching Ganja and Hess, I'm like, this is like Mumblecore well before Mumblecore in my sense, or in a sense, because it's, you know, it's, it's just very conversational. It's very relaxed. Some of the times you can't necessarily hear everything that's said, and that's kind of the heart of what Mumblecore was or is. So um, I really like that. That also wraps into making it feel very realistic. The other thing is the dialogue, the way it's written, is extremely conversational. And I think that works really well. It makes it more interesting. It makes everything more relaxed. And it kind of pulls you in in a conversational way. It's something I don't see a lot in film. And for that reason, I really enjoyed it in this film. So big shout out to Bill Gunn for, the, for his writing on the script. It's a very well done script. Uh, I think the storytelling in it is good. The dialogue writing in it is even better. The dialogue is very good, and that's kind of a lot of what kept my interest in the film. Um, the, the audio has a lot of problems, to be honest, because it, it seems like they didn't uh, do any recording of audio in post. I mean, maybe they did, but it doesn't play that way. Uh, there's a lot of echo to it. You know, people sound far away. Uh, it seems like they just kind of had a boom mic on set and that's kind of all they used. Uh, but that kind of like wraps in also with the making it feel more realistic, the whole mumblecore aspect, that type of stuff. Um, so it doesn't fully hinder the film and you get used to it. But when you're first watching it, the first, I don't know, like 20 minutes or so, you're just kind of like, oh, that audio is not sounding the best. So it's just, it's, you know, it's just a thing. Uh, Bill Gunn put himself in the film, by the way. Uh, he plays a early role, and he did a really good job. To be honest, I thought he was the best actor in the film, and he kind of stole the show when he was on the screen. So not only is he a good writer and a good director, but he's a very good actor. So the full package for Bill Gunn, who I didn't really know a ton about, but uh, this film was a very good introduction for me to uh, Bill Gunn. He was really good in this. Um the most enjoyable moments of the film, in my opinion, are when he's on screen. Uh, dialogue's very well crafted. I already talked about that. The combination of the writing, the acting, and the look of the film makes it extremely conversational. I was talking about that. Uh, how it's cut into parts helps it with the whole vampirism versus addiction thing. Talked about that. Uh, one of the biggest flaws of the film is that it, it has a weird flow to it because it will, uh, overall, it, it's pretty slow. And a lot of the times that's fine because of how the filmmaking is, how the dialogue is, how the, the relaxed environment and tone of it kind of is. But then it gets kind of crazy. It amps up where it really needs to story-wise. 
but then you have these long stretches of where things are just going too slow for too long and it really messes up the pacing really messes up the flow of it i think this film should have been edited down a bunch at about two hours there's not enough story there for the two hours to be um to be uh what's the word i'm looking for to be justified. You can't justify it, in my opinion. Uh, it really should have been cut down. And probably the last about 45 minutes of the film really felt way, way, way too slow and like nothing was really going on. It was terribly paced at that point. But I would say about the first, meh, like hour of the film maybe is really cool, really engaging, really fun to watch. And um, after that, you kind of feel like you want to start checking out, to be honest. So it's a little imbalanced as a film. Um, there's an effective auditory cue in this for when addiction starts kicking in, basically. When, when the nagging of the addiction is starting to hit characters, um, it's, it's this particular sound, particular kind of, like, song. And you'll see what I mean if you, if you watch the film or if you've already seen the film and you'll know what I'm talking about. It's very effective to kind of, instead of telling people, you know, having the character be like, oh man, I, I need blood, I want blood right now, instead just hearing it as an audience member and you come to that realization on your own. And it's kind of like creeping up on the character and it like builds. It's very effective and I like that aspect of it. Uh, the blood in this actually does not look good, just so people know. It looks like watery tomato juice, to be honest. It's... um. You know, it's like a watered-down version of V8, really. So it looks terrible. The blood does not look at all realistic. The viscosity of it, the color of it, it's just... But whatever, you know, it was the 70s. One of the characters' reactions to something major in this film is very, very unrealistic, and that's one of my biggest pet peeves with, with this film. It's, it's kind of a small thing, because you get past it, but it's just very unrealistic, the reaction. And it seems like... They should have done something else, to be honest. They really should have done something else. Um, there's a little bit of commentary in this on colonialism, which um, it's not, like, it's a little subtle, but it's also not subtle at the same time. If I guess you could kind of miss it if you're not really being super attentive, but um, I didn't feel like it was super, super subtle. So most people should probably get that kind of few moments of, you know, commentary on colonialism. There are some cool hallucinatory, there's some cool hallucinatory imagery, sorry, I don't know why it's so tough right now, uh, that's in this, and a lot of it ties into the addiction in the film, the sickness that kind of creeps up on people, so I think how it's tied in with that, and the way it's shot, the way it looks, the way it sounds, very effective in my opinion, uh, so I like those components of the film as well. Um, then I wrote about the lengthy church thing at the very end that really should have been cut down massively because it really kills the end of the film, to be honest. Um, I feel like they could have kind of picked the pace back up and pulled people way more in at the very end because obviously things, a lot more happens at the end of the film. But with that ex super extended church scene, uh, it just, it killed a lot of pace and killed a lot of interest and that should have been cut way down. And, you know, my last note was what I had said, that, like, the past maybe 45 minutes of the film is way too long and drawn out, loses a lot of attention. So it's one of those films, and I've seen plenty of films like this, where it's interest-heavy in the first half of the movie or so, and then the last portion just starts to really, really peter out, and that's how this feels. And I think that that speaks a little bit to... Not as much to the actual script, but more to the actual directing and filmmaking aspect of it, where it seems like, you know, Bill Gunn maybe was super focused in the beginning, and then towards the end, he's just like, eh, you know, let's put in a little extra stuff, let's do a little bit more, let's get a little more interesting, some longer shots, some more interesting looking shots, which is cinematography, and it looks pretty cool, and uh, the directing's good, and the acting's solid, so overall, pretty good film. Um, oh. My biggest problem is this, just this pacing is so bad and it's way too long. And for that reason, what I give it, uh, I'm going to do my five star rating out of five stars with half stars in play. I think I can give this a, I'm mm, between a three and a three and a half, to be honest. Uh, I'm going to go three and a half. I'm going to be a little more generous because that dialogue really is nice in this film. 
and the whole conversational aspect of it and mumblecore ish is is cool. Um, you also, you know, when you watch this, some people could say just like, oh, the quality and you know, it's you have to think it's the seventies. Watch this and remember the times you were in. So there you go. But anyway, um, good film. I do recommend it. Uh, and like I said, I also really recommend that documentary Horror Noir on Shudder. So if, and if you don't have Shudder, at least give it a shot. I think they have like a seven day free trial or something like that. So at the least you could jump on, do that free trial, watch Horror Noir, watch Ganja and Hess, and then just give it up. But I would say there's a lot more stuff on there you should definitely watch. But anyway, thank you for checking this out. If you could do me a big favor, hit that subscribe. Very, very painless for you. Literally takes a second. can mean a lot for my channel. I would appreciate that. Put some comments down there. Have you seen this? What are your thoughts? Do you want to see it now that you've seen this review? Let's talk. And then you can do a thumbs up if you want to. But thank you very much for checking this out. Until next time, keep it brutal.